It's 10.06 and I would like to call this meeting to order. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the CSTD session. This morning, we will take up item four, presentation of reports on science, technology, and innovation policy reviews. Before we start with this presentation, with the presentations, I wish to remind participants that as announced in the program, interpretation services for interventions by remote participants is limited to a cumulative total of 30 minutes per session. Once the 30 minutes is exceeded, interpretation will subsequently be provided only for in-person interventions. Today, we will be launching the STI policy review reports of Angola and Botswana, as well as the technology foresight report for Botswana. We will start with the overview of the Angola Innovation Report. I will first invite Mr. Clovis Frere, Chief of the Technology and Innovation Policy Section in the Division on Technology and Logistics, followed by remarks from Mr. Edu Stock, the Resident Rep, UNDP Angola Office. Mr. Frere, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to present an overview of the Science Technology Innovation Policy Review of Angola under this agenda item. The UNDP Angola and the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Technology, Innovation, and UNCTADS collaborate in the preparation of this study on innovation and entrepreneurship. The objective was to assess the national innovation system and also map the ecosystem of innovation and new digital technologies in the country. The focus on innovation is primarily on economic diversification and the expansion of productive capacities of the economy to produce goods and services that are new to the country and generate jobs. This, this study took place at a critical juncture. The Angolan economy had contracted in six consecutive years, and as for many other countries, the COVID-19 pandemic had worsened the country's situation in the context of unemployment and difficulties in the development of the private sector. Angola's economy is very dependent of the oil sector. The concentration of exports of Angola is one of the highest in the world and much higher than in the average of the region. Crude oil accounted for 86% of the country's exports in 2019. And recently, Angola has also experienced an increase in geographical concentration of exports, with more than 70% towards Asian countries. And the country has low capacity, productive capacities, and is highly dependent on imports for most of the products consumed in the economy. The situation reaffirmed the need to diversify the economy find new strategies and new resources that allow its growth and guarantee the economic and social well-being of the Angolan families. The process of economic diversification through manufacturing and more knowledge-intensive services represents the most promising option to ensure sustained growth in Angola and as well to increase resilience to external factors. During the last few decades, Angola has been able to slightly diversify its economy. From 1996 to 2013, the number of exported product categories increased, coinciding with the increasing diversification recorded in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. But in Angola, the, econom the economy has diversified, but continues to produce products that are more common, which may other many other countries are able to produce. This indicates that the economy has not become more complex with greater technological content. In this sense, the identification of strategic priorities to diversification is critical. 
what a country produces and exports is fundamental to its development. To stimulate growth, diversification must have a direction. It should be aimed at products considered more complex, which require more productive and technological capacities. To assist the government in that regard, the report identified the products that Angola does not produce, export, but uh, are close to those that it exports and also have higher than average uh, technical te uh, technological content. In Angola, mechanical apparatus and plastics and plastic articles are always among the three main sectors in terms of diversification potential. In other words, these sectors products offer a high degree of opportunities, both from the point of view of ex export potential and import substitution. Other sectors such as pharmaceuticals and organic chemicals offer also high opportunities for import and export substitution in work world economies. When we consider the global economy, the US is the market with the greatest opportunities for exports, accounting for 12% of expanding market share, expanding market share, followed by China, Germany, and France. And when considering African continent, the most promising market seems uh, to be in Egypt, 26%, followed by Nigeria, Morocco, South Africa, and Tunisia. In this study, we also make this analysis in relation to potential new products in agriculture and agribusiness sector. Diversification is the result of innovation, and this figure depicts Angola's national innovation system in a stylized way. The main role of the system is to convert knowledge into innovation. Innovation requires all subsystems of the systems to operate. The science and technology subsystem feeds scientific knowledge into the system. Many innovations find their origins in the scientific knowledge, but knowledge is only commercially valuable to society once it's converted in products and services. This conversion occurs only once other subsystems are involved. The subsystem on technology innovation, and I like here to highlight two of them, an economic one that relates to the means of economy and planning with one important program there on economic diversification and port substitution, another related to the Ministry of Industry and Commerce with, it, with its industrial institutes. In this context, the government of Angola has implemented and created various policies, programs, and institutions to promote industry and innovation and infrastructure. We found that Angola has made a lot of progress in setting the national innovation system, and that now it could concentrate in making more fit for purpose. For example, the dotted line in this chart, chart links uh, show links that need to be strengthened, such as between the innovation-related programs of different agencies of the government. Innovation that results in diversification ultimately happens in the companies. We need to focus on strategic support to private sector for, for it to innovate. The basis of innovation is an idea or concept that if it's successful, materialize into a small company, which can grow into a large company, expand both domestically and internationally. And each one of these uh, phases require different approach and support. The innovation system must be prepared to support each and every one of them. It's essential to create an enabling environment to support innovative entrepreneurship. Angola is characterized by a large number of entrepreneurs of necessity, mostly in the informal sector, rather entrepreneurs of opportunity. Official, official entrepreneurship support programs in Angola should support individuals with the best business ideas. Differentiate companies that start a business in a sector that is common in the economy, like retail or restaurants, from those that seek to diversify and, and add uh, knowledge, uh, technological content, including new technologies, digital technology and other technologies. Establish institutions uh, and mechanisms specialized in technology-based companies as they require differentiated support. And employment should be the result, not the goal of these uh, activities. The goal is diversification of the economy and, and the, as, as a result of that, there'll be the creation of jobs. I would like to conclude highlighting six key messages of this study. First, it is necessary to shift the strategic orientation on science technology innovation from an emphasis on science to a focus on technology innovation. This requires a coordinated mechanism between government agencies and between them and the private sector and the building of an environment that fully supports the national business ecosystem. Second, prioritize technology innovation for economic diversification. Efforts 
must be made to strategically support priority sectors with greater potential for growth, structural change, and increased productivity, including with the uh, help of uh, new technologies, digital technologies. Third, scientific technological innovation policies should be considered as an instrument for industrial and economic policy. Angola is at an early stage of technological and industrial devel development, and at this stage, the policies and policy instruments of the science technology innovation um, should be oriented to the demand of the private sector and industry, focus on the availability of human capital and technological support necessary for the construction of internal technological and productive capacities. In this respect, strong links should be formed between STI policies and initiatives in industrial policies. Fourth, focus on strategic support from the the, the, to the private sector. National com companies need to obtain and absorb new technologies. They need support to find and acquire these technologies, as well as incentives for them to adopt and assimilate into local economy through learning, connections, and demonstration effects. This requires the government to be seen as a business partner supporting the private sector in the acquisition and the development of technologies through demand-driven approach. Fifth, Angola will, will have to increase short and long-term funding for the national innovation system. The re real expansion of the financing for STI should come from the private sector through greater investment in R&D and innovation by larger companies and through the banking system avoiding to use a uh, conservative lending practice. And six, and to conclude, the impetus of the technological learning, innovation, and economic diversification must come from the highest level, and this will provide the greater coherence to this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Freire. Let me turn to Mr. Stoke. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Minister. Minister, it's a it's a pleasure to be here, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, to to share some further thoughts for just a few minutes on the study uh, we did together. Uh, and just like we have in the in the report, the UNDP and the UNCTAD and the Ministry of Angola are closely coordinated in this, and it's been really a pleasure for us to to develop this uh, this report. Um, I'll give you like three uh, uh, thoughts um, to connect to, to Clovis's presentation just now. Uh, but first, I wanted to to tell you just a few uh, key facts on Angola that I think is important that you know very well. Is that Angola is the third sub-Saharan economy of Africa, right? This is after Nigeria and after South Africa. So this is not a small economy. And Angola is definitely a country that is growing and becoming a larger player in Af on the African and the world stage. Uh, and so the diversification of the economy that Clovis was just talking about is a huge opportunity also for further growth of Angola, of other African countries, and also of the globalized economy. However, with this third largest uh, sub-Saharan economy, what we also find is that 80% of the Angolan economy, uh, of people working in the Angolan economy, are working in the informal sector. And that is definitely a challenge if you want to sort of move forward and position yourself. Uh, we now have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is a huge opportunity for Africa, a huge opportunity for, uh, for Angola, and a huge opportunity for other countries to invest as well. But if you have such a large informal economy, it becomes difficult to move forward. So a process to sort of get to a more formal economy is very important. And for example, this is, um, I'm looking at Peru. Uh, at the, we also worked previously on some of these things on the informal economy and we're taking some lessons learned from there as well. And then there's also uh, this issue of uh, in Angola, which is uh, in a way a challenge, but also at the same time, an opportunity is a very high population growth. 1.3 million Angolans are born every year. And every year, 700,000 <clears throat> Angolans go into the labor force and they need to find a, a job. So, and that is a huge opportunity for demographic dividend. 
and also that the, the, the economic growth of Angola should take into account that population growth, uh, growth and offer these, these youth new opportunities and jobs. So three things just to connect and then I'll close my, my remarks. Uh, what Clovis presented on making innovation cross-sectoral, cross-ministry, cross-private sector, academia, civil society is absolutely key uh, for, uh, for Angola to, to move ahead as, as is described in this particular uh, report. Uh, and that may sound straightforward, but if you think about the resources that are allocated more in sectors, it becomes more challenging. But if you can connect it to something like uh, Clovis was just presenting, like economic diversification and have a, like a higher goal, which is in itself cross-sectoral, then different resources from different ministries, private sector and others can all come together on uh, a platform together with this high level leadership that also was pitched uh, just now. Uh, we personally in UNDP are very convinced that um, system thinking is a very, very important way to move ahead and to move away from a project type of approach. Because if you have the system thinking, you have a larger picture and you can integrate different uh, type of ministries and actors into, into your field. Our office is a global pilot also for systems thinking in UNDP, and we're working closely with the government on this. And we can tell you more about it um, at some point. The second point that I wanted to make to you is that um, it is very important, uh, according to the report as well, that the the innovation is targeted to some kind of national priority, right? To so, to some kind of national impetus, and that national impetus is described in the Angola's new national development plan, uh, which has three pillars, and one of those pillars is this uh, the, the pillar for economic diversification of the country. So the, it, there's a very nice connection of this particular report to the national priorities. And what uh, the minister under excellent leadership has done also is to uh, make sure that this, uh, this report is put into all the documentation that is being considered for the national development plan, which should come out soon. So, and then my final point that I wanted to uh, tell you is that uh, it's not like innovation is not happening in Angola. There's a lot happening in Angola. And there's a lot of dynamism uh, going on in the country. The government is very dynamic in trying out new things. Uh, and we've been working together and sort of for already following some of the, of the guidelines that are in the report. And uh, maybe just to give you an example and to come back to the issue of the, of the informal economy. So there's an inter very interesting program in Angola called PRE, is the program for the conversion of the, of the informal economy and to try to help those that are working in the informal economy get to a more formalized state. But it's not like a black or white process. It's like one day you're informal and then the next day you're totally formal. You, you go through this long process and people need to get incentives to move to a more formalized state, right? And the PRE program is considering with various ministries, various types of incentives, such as microcredit, such as access to social services, such as capacity uh, training, um, and other types of things, also taking into account very much the role of uh, women and the very important role of the Angolan women in society, in that they have also specific needs that need to be met. Otherwise, we get this gender inequality, and then still many more men uh, come through. But this program of prey is really very interesting because in one and a half years, We've been able to get it to already like set 300,000 uh, informal vendors up into this road of formalization. And in the new uh, period, um, probably more than 400,000 more uh, informal uh, vendors will be uh, touched upon uh, and sort of and guided uh, and, and moved through this process. So that is just one example, but there's not much more time for me now to go into many more examples, but I just want to stress that uh, the minister and, and the other ministers and the government of Angola, the private sector of Angola, is moving forward and is really uh, uh, taking to heart this innovation uh, report. So my three messages were innovation cross-sectoral, uh, very important, 
uh, but also to think about how you allocate the resources and how you make it actually happen. And there I, I sort of am pitching the system thinking type of ID here. The, se the second uh, item is that, um, that it is very important for innovation, according to this report, and, and we feel this way too, to pitch it to a specific area of work, in this case, economic diversification that is part of the national development plan and the national priorities. And then the third thing that many of the, that we can build on the innovation actions and ideas that are already happening in Angola, such as, for example, the example on prey for the informal economy that I just mentioned to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stock, for your presentation. I now have the great pleasure to invite Ms. Maria Du Rosario Sambu, Minister of Higher Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation of Angola, who will present the follow up actions and way forward for Angola. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here. First of all, let me express our gratitude to ANTAD and to UNDP in Angola for all the support to the Angolan government to carry out for the second time the process of STAI policy review. In 2008, in, in 29 May, the Science, Technology and Innovation Policy Review for Angola was presented and discussed here in Geneva at the 11th session of the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development. This 28th STI policy review was crucial for the formulation and approval of the STI policy in 2011, as well as its implementation strategy and coordination mechanism. In the 2015 UNESCO report on science, the Angola's innovation system was classified as viable in the set of countries in the South African Development Country region, together with Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Seychelles, Tanzania, and Zambia. Others were classified as fragile or in progress. Viable systems were considered the ones that having been ground, but with hesitations, although in a context of political stability. Although in the last 21 years, remarkable progress has been registered in the Angolan National Innovation System, as Stork told before, mainly considering the end of the civil war at 2002, we recognize that there is still a lot to do and a big space to fine tune and promote an effective Angolan innovation system aligned to the ongoing economic diversification in the country to create more and better paid jobs and promote economic structural transformation with more equality and sustainable results. 10 years after the approval of the science, technology and innovation policy, Considering the need to adapt the STI policy to the current context at national and global levels and the respective needs for achieving the sustainable development goals with support of the UNTAD Nations Development Program in Angola, we requested UNTAD for the preparation of, a, of this study that was presented here as a critical step for the steep review. We acknowledge the UNTAD steep review as a valuable tool being an analytical and policy learning process for our country's STI stakeholders to understand the key strengths and weakness of the national 
innovation system and identify strategic, strategic priorities for its development. The relevant recommendations of its deep review involves not only the policies under the responsibility of the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Technology and Innovation, but all ministries that impact innovation, as well as other STI stakeholders, including the private sector, academy and entrepreneurs. The commitment of the Angolan government with the STI policy review led to this study being presented to the government on the 9th March, precisely 20 days ago, Clovis was there presenting the study, a economic team chaired by the Minister of State for Economic Coordination. The economic team includes all the ministers of the economic sector and the Minister for Public Administration, Labor and Social Assistance. This team is a body of the Economic Commission led by the President of the Republic. At this meeting of the economic team, it was concluded that the recommendations of the study should be considered in the government planning documents, namely the Angola 2015 long-term strategy and the 2023 to 2020 27 National Development Plan. Finally, we reiterate our thanks to all the support that ANTAD has given to us in this process, and we, and we continue to count on ANTAD and in UNDP for the following phases, namely the training of human resources to implement the recommendations and all the subsequent steps that are required for the effective revision of the STI policy. And thank you very much for your attention. I thank the minister for her remarks. Now we will have the presentation of the overview of the STI policy report and technology foresight report of Botswana. I wish to invite Mr. Michael Lim from the Technology and Innovation for Development section and of DTL to present the report. Mr. Lim, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will just briefly go over some of the main findings of the SDI policy review for Botswana. It is a very interesting country that is making good progress. It has actually uh, had one of the best growth performances in Africa. So some of the key features in um, of the STIP review, it is the first STIP review that Ongtad has done that has incorporated a foresight exercise for STI, something which the commission has been calling for for years. And finally, we have managed to implement this in one of our countries, our client countries. So we are very happy about this. It is also the first STIP review by UNCTAD that has been fully financed by a beneficiary country, Botswana itself. We collaborated very closely with the Department for Research Science and Technology, the DRST in Botswana. And I would like to thank them very much for the close collaboration we have had during the past uh, three years. The review, the purpose is to review the um, innovation ecosystem in Botswana and the implementation issues, the capacity constraints surrounding STI policy in Botswana and implementation of the 2011 research science technology and innovation policy. We have used a multi-stakeholder ap approach that has included a number of different types of methods. We call it a mixed methods. Um, the novel item in this review is the foresight tools, which included horizon scanning, questionnaires, workshops, and scenario planning as part of the process. I have to mention that COVID-19 was a big challenge. It presented a lot of issues because we started the project as COVID, the pandemic was spreading in Botswana, and we had to rely a lot on virtual communication means. This presented some challenges with uh, connectivity and arranging discussions and meetings. Uh, 
The government was also restructured in May of 2022 as the drafting of the two reports, the SDI policy review and the foresight report were basically being finished. And this also uh, presented some challenge. We had to change all the names, but the, the recommendations, the findings have not materially changed. They remain valid in my opinion. So some of the key findings, um, as I mentioned, Botswana has uh, had a stellar growth performance among African countries since the 1960s. It has made good progress in many areas, but one of the uh, key challenges it continues to face is slow structural transformation. And this is one of the key goals in the policy um, policies, development policy goals in Botswana, such as Vision 2036, which uh, foresee that Botswana would be transitioning from a natural resource base to a knowledge-based economy. This transformation has been going very slowly. There is very good potential in Botswana, but weak innovation capacity is undermining progress in the economy and in the country overall. There has been good progress on education, which of course is one of the key pillars needed for having a strong innovation ecosystem and innovation capacity. But more is needed in terms of science, technology, and engineering and mathematics, so STEM disciplines, technical skills, soft skills, and higher education. And this includes issues of quality and also matching the curricula and the skills to the needs of the country and future challenges. The R&D system and the SDI system more broadly, we can call it the innovation ecosystem. Uh, they are highly fragmented. There are many silos in operation and coordination is weak. In addition, there is uh, inadequate prioritization of um, policies related of goals and policies related to STI. And because of this uh, issue of prioritization, we thought along with Botswana colleagues that the STI foresight would be very useful to help to establish national STI priorities. The institutional governance for STI we found is inadequate. Uh, the balance of policy focus is similarly to Angola. It's quite heavy on research and development. It's weak on technology and innovation. And in addition, the 2011 RSTI policy, that's the research, science, technology, and innovation policy is now outdated and should be revised. RSTI policy implementation is slow and partial. This has been one of the key challenges in the country. And this is something that we find in a number of uh, developing countries. Part of the issue for this, uh, accounting for this is that monitoring and evaluation, what we call m &E, is inadequate in Botswana in general, and also for STI policy. As with Angola again, the financing for STI is inadequate and gross expenditure on R&D is below the national target that was set in 2000 uh, to achieve 2% 2 of GDP of uh, R&D as a percentage of GDP by 2016. That goal was set in the 2011 RSTI policy. Currently, uh, GERD is around 0.4% in, in 2014, which is the most recent figure that we have. Finally, private sector engagement, engagement and support for the private sector are both weak. And in fact, the private sector is a very weak link in the innovation eco ecosystem more broadly. I just want to go over some of the key recommendations in the review. There are some 27 key recommendations, and these are some of the most important. They relate to the key findings. The uh, first is the need to improve STEM education, technical and soft skills. And also there's an issue with increasing the participation of women in STEM higher education and in R&D and in science more broadly. We recommend strengthening the institutional governance for STI. And there are a number of recommendations. I don't have time to go into them in the review itself, but we recommend establishing a directorate for RSTI, a high level committee on RSTI, and strengthening parliamentary engagement in STI issues, because um, we agree that high level engagement in the country is necessary 
in order to harness STI for development. Third, we recommend rebalancing the focus on in the policy frameworks and also in the discussions in the country on STI to have a more balanced focus on science, technology, and innovation, those three areas, R&D, technology, and innovation. We also recommend revising the RSTI policy of 2011 and improving the monitoring and evaluation for STI. Fourth, we recommend establishing clear national STI priorities, and we suggest that this could build on the process that we started through the STI foresight exercise. Fifth, we recommend increasing financing for R&D and innovation. And in this respect, we think that uh, the innovation fund that has been set up could be expanded. Um, in addition, there could be consideration of a mineral levy on diamonds, for example, and also putting in place incentives for private sector investment in R&D and uh, technology and innovation more broadly because uh, there is a limit to how much investment can be made by the government alone. Sixth, we recommend increasing engagement and support to the private sector, as this is one of the weak links in uh, Botswana. Seventh, we recommend enhancing the promotion of digital transformation via the Smart Botswana program, which is in place in Botswana. Uh, using a whole of government approach, setting realistic timeframes, establishing specific means of financing, building digital literacy and digital skills. Eighth, we recommend upgrading international STI cooperation efforts. There are already quite a few uh, efforts in STI cooperation in Botswana. We think that a separate unit should be set up and these efforts need to be strengthened. Botswana is a fairly small country and it relies quite heavily on international collaboration. Eighth, uh, ninth, we recommend strengthening the R&D system and research management and use, putting research more effectively into use to create innovation. And in this respect, we recommend establishing a national research fund and a national research council or equivalent body, establishing mechanisms for data collection, um, Managing open, uh, encouraging open science and open data and designing a national data policy. The issue of data is an important one facing all countries, including Botswana. We also recommend adding a focus on new and frontier technologies, which so far has not received much focus in the country, but it's becoming more important for all countries, including Botswana. We recommend also building STI policy capacity in key areas and also human resources. The uh, group that is responsible for coordinating STI policy is very much understaffed. So we include in these key policy areas, uh, STI policy more broadly, but also specifically STI foresight and technology assessment. And finally, we recommend harnessing STI across different sustainable development challenges, which would include areas such as agriculture, industry, health, environment, et cetera. And we have sections on those in the report. Overall, to sum up, because I don't want to take too much time, the main message is that Botswana is progressing and it is making a lot of progress in uh, different areas. But one of the areas which needs a lot more work is on harnessing STI policy and harnessing science, technology, and innovation for development. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Lim, for your presentation. I now have the great pleasure to invite the Acting Permanent Secretary on Science and Technology, Ms. Lesogo Chami, who will deliver the statement of Her Excellency, or His Excellency, Mr. Tulagano, Merafi Sigoko, the Minister for Communication, Knowledge and Technology of Botswana. P.S. you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Thank you. Let me recognize the Secretary General of the UNCTAD. Ms. Rebecca Grinspan and the chair of the CSTD, Mr. Louis Chill, and recognize you, moderator, 
uh, H.E. Ka. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me first attend the apology on behalf of the minister, Honorable Tularano Merafes for not being able to address this august uh, gathering um, concerning the review of the STI policy of Botswana and the development of the foresight um, exercise or so going through the foresight exercise. The minister would have loved to really address you, but he had an emergency this morning to address. Firstly, let me start uh, by giving you background and context of, um, for the review of the policy. To start with, Botswana has started, started coming up with the national visions. And the first one was in the vision 2016, where then we wanted to have pro prosperity for all Botswana or Botswana citizens. When 2016 came, we had achieved some, but not all. So we came up with another vision, 2036, that by the year 2036, Botswana should have really transformed. And during this time, we are driving towards achieving the prosperity for all in Botswana. And there are four pillars that this, this vision is anchored on. This is sustainable economic development, human and social development, sustainable environment, and governance, peace, and security. All these pillars are aligned to regional and continental strategies, as well as the sustainable development goals. On the science and, and uh, science policy framework, the first national explicit science and technology policy is that of 1998. This policy intended um, to achieve or to pursue science and technology led economic development so as to strengthen and consolidate national efforts towards sustainable economic diversification. It was then that the government recognized or even made it, made it quite explicit that the role of science and technology is in Botswana is quite, uh, is, is quite important to diversify the economy and to improve productivity. In 20, 2008, we revised, we reviewed the policy of 1998 and found out that somewhere there were some dis, uh, discrepancies or we did not really reach where we wanted to reach. So in 2011, the parliament, 2012 actually, the parliament um, approved a revision of the 1998 policy whose objectives were to promote research and innovation in areas of priority areas, in priority areas for sustainable socioeconomic development of Botswana. It also focused on mobilizing adequate resources, both human and financial, for research, technology development and transfer, and as well as for innovation and development of technology-driven and knowledge intensive industries. It also sought to provide an enabling environment for the coordination, development and implementation of the RSTI policy, as well as to cultivate a sense of responsibility among the science and technology institutions to carry out research that would change lives. To promote the establishment of collaborations, partnerships, and linkage, linkages, and to build a national culture of innovation and integration of traditional knowledge into modern science. This policy was supposed to have been reviewed five years after implementation, when it was, it was um, developed and approved it, was, uh, it also had an implementation plan. We were not able to do that in 2016, but discussions with UNCTAD had already started. We eventually managed to make, to make resources available to commence the review in 2020, 
It was then under the Ministry of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology. Botswana took advantage of UNCTAD's commencement to assist countries with the foresight exercise and included the STI foresight together with the policy review. The objectives then of this deep review were included that we assess the STI system in Botswana, identifying key strengths and weaknesses of the innovation system, evaluate the status and implementation of the policy of uh, 2011. It was approved by parliament in 2012 and create a shared understanding of the STI policy among the key stakeholders nationally to contribute to strengthened implementation of STI policies and programs, strengthen stakeholder engagement between policymakers, government, private sector, academia, research institutes, and the civil society to conduct an STI foresight exercise and recommend how to implement the findings thereof in relation to the STI plan of action and to prepare the plan of action on STI in Botswana based on the step review and discussions amongst the key stakeholders. The process of the policy review was quite consultative. Um, it was, the consultation was quite extensive and we tried as much as possible to be inclusive. And the steps included um, the scoping, the fact-finding mission, and consolidation of the reports. On the foresight study side was foresight uh, exercise that started in February, 2022. It had the steps included the foresight training session for capacity building on foresight and building a, a common understanding of the foresight process because this was the first time we were going through it. So we needed to be brought to a common understanding. The design and implementation of a survey of stakeholders in Botswana to develop an initial list of STI priorities. And then there were surveys that were uh, conducted and the report uh, was consul uh, consolidated, the reports. Let me indicate that there was quite, um, it, quite a, a lot of interaction with stakeholders. The final reports were submitted in December 2022. Our experience with the going through the policy review is that it stimulated a lot of discussions in Botswana on the role of, of research, science, technology, and innovation uh, the, in, in Botswana. And it revealed that, yes, as Botswana, we have made progress over time in many important areas of Botswana. We have research institutions in place. We have universities at public and private, uh, within public, public and private sector in place. There's a Botswana Innovation Hub, which is a science and technology park. Um, well, I, I call it, we call it the big one, but there are smaller ones as well. There's a National Innovation Fund in place. The National Research Fund is uh, underway. We have also established the National Research and Education Network, which uh, has, is just starting operation. Some of the major challenges in our national system of innovation that have emerged included that the COVID-19 has really exposed uh, that Botswana needs to become a more dynamic, innovation-led and knowledge-based economy and society, and to the need to strengthen governance uh, of, of RSTI. Both at government, government and private sector need to increase investment into research and technology development. And of course, um, what we found out also was that there's uh, a lack of effective system for prioritizing national RSTI efforts, which is why we embarked on the STI foresight exercise. 
we also realized like um, Mr. Lim has just indicated that the policy of 2012 really its implementation was very weak and it's all because of uh, uh, most of these um, challenges that uh, are in the national system of innovation. The foresight exercise, as I've already indicated, was the first of its kind in Botswana. And our experience then was that it enabled participants to deduce possible futures for science, technology, and innovation of Botswana. And we came to the conclusion that the foresight exercise needs to be institutionalized so as to keep pace with the technological changes. The foresight exercise of for Botswana was prepared in the context of the broader science, technology, and innovation environment nationally, globally, at continental level as well. And it's, it's an important tool for us because we see it as uh, something that um, an exercise that we need to embark on, like I've already indicated, to institutionalize it. For achievement of the reset agenda priorities, which His Excellency the President, Dr. Mpwezi Masisi, came up with, led the government in, uh, with, in, uh, as we came out of COVID-19. And these priorities include digitization, value chain development, mindset change, and saving Botswana from the impacts of COVID-19. And this includes any other pandemics that can, that can come in the future. The challenges that we encountered as we were conducting the stick review were mainly related to COVID-19 firstly, in that we had to modify the methodology from having physically, physical conduct, consultative um, processes to conducting them virtually. And then this came up with the other with the other challenges due to poor connectivity, and uh, that really it it was all around around the poor connectivity. It really, like um, I've just indicated, it exposed um, Botswana in in these areas of connectivity because we were working from home, we were locked down, and all those. And we were not, um, people were not quite uh, equipped with gadgets and the relevant connectivity. And hence, it took a long time. The next step, steps then, after we have received the, the reports, we are currently internalizing the recommendations to present them to cabinet. And the next will be to implement the recommendations after approval. And here we are looking at coming up with the relevant strategies as they have been recommended. There are possible policy revisions, as uh, Mr. Lim indicated, to emphasize on technology and innovation, and also to strengthen the coordination aspect of research. Let me highlight that as we go on into the next steps, Botswana has set and set a target to raise the national GDP growth from the current 4.3% to 5.7% by 2036. And what this demands us as a country to do is to change the way that STI has been conducted in the country. We're looking at protecting and profiting that is increasing commercialization um, of results that come out of the STI. And also look at rationalization of um, structures in order to improve efficiency and effectiveness. And this, I should highlight that is, is currently, we have actually started um, the process at national level. You will have had um, when Mr. Lim was presenting that the ministries were rationalized last year. And it's not only changing the names of ministries, it's also changing the structuring within the ministries in order to improve the efficiencies. 
in conclusion, Chair, we would like to indicate that going through this deep review and the foresight, these we saw that they presented a new lens through which to view ourselves as a country and also brought better understanding of the STI, how it can, how to really go about um, its coordination. By valuing STI as a socioeconomic driver, Botswana could achieve our achieving prosperity for all by 2036. So we are determined to follow and to implement the recommendations so that we achieve our national aspirations. We understand that the foresight report is a guideline and that as policymakers, we should take action to get onto a trajectory that will take us to the preferred future where Botswana will be thriving as a country. And finally, we wish to appreciate UNCTAD for its support and sourcing the best experts in the steep review and the foresight study. study. We were quite gratified at the expertise and the facilitation that they gave to us. And we encourage other countries to also take advantage of this dispensation that has been av availed by UNCTAD. We are also appreciative of the engagement of a national consultant, which was building capacity nationally as well. We are still to finalize the process by a capacity building workshop for STI stakeholders. And this we shall continue conclude this year. We are grateful for UNCTAD once again and also thankful for the technical group nationally that we put up and the reference committee who reviewed the reports. Ladies and gentlemen, Chair, I would like to thank you for your attention. I thank the permanent secretary for her remarks on behalf of the minister. The floor is now open for an interactive discussion. I have on my list Ms. Patamawadi Pukanokol, President of Thailand Science, Research and Innovation. You have the floor, ma'am. The update of the recent development of the STI policy and its ecosystem in Thailand. To give you a brief overview of Thailand, Thailand is an upper middle income country with the population of about uh, six, uh, 67 million. When looking at the global innovation ecosystem, Thailand ranks 43rd among the 132 economies in the year 2022. In 2019, we merged the Ministry of Science and Technology, Office of Higher Education Commission, and other key funding agencies to be under one umbrella of the new ministry. That is the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation. The main reason for the reform is that, first of all, to reduce the fragmentation of STI activities. Second is to enhance the collaboration of public and private partnership. Hope, we hope that the uh, impact of R&D uh, by collaboration and uh, demand-driven investment uh, can enhance the contribution of STI to the development of the country. Thirdly, we hope to induce more investment in R&D. 
and STI investment in Thailand. As a result, in the year 2021, our R&D investment per capita was increasing uh, to 1.33%, 68% of which was from private, while the rest was the public R&D investments. The total number of R&D personnel in Thailand was 25 per uh, uh, 10,000 people, which is still uh, not much. So the goal is to reach 40 uh, scientists per 10,000 people by the year 2027. Under this big reform, Thailand Science and Research and Innovation, or TSRI in short, where I am leading, we set up a five-year national science research and innovation plan and TSRI allocate budget to, uh, I mean, STI uh, budget to 177 institutes in alliance with the new uh, STI plan. Okay. And the plan includes uh, first uh, economic development strategy. The second one is society and environmental uh, sustainable development. The third one is future frontier research. And the fourth one is strategy for development of manpower. And we expect that, that uh, by giving the focus to include SDGs and biocircular green economy or BCG, uh, hopefully we'll, this will make Thailand stable and prosperous and sustainable developments. So uh, this is uh, what I could say, uh, the reform and the new progress of uh, STI uh, policy and ecosystem in Thailand. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to explain briefly about Thailand. Thank you. Thank you. I will now give the floor to the distinguished delegate from Guatemala. You have the floor. Microphone. Population of 50 million and GDP of 77.6 billion. Guatemala is the largest economy in Central America and a upper middle income country. In the middle of the COVID-19 situation, Guatemala posted a strong recovery with a, with a GDP growth of 8% in 2021 and 3.4% in 2022. Um, Guatemala has a great opportunity for transformation, focusing on pro priority areas for accelerating inclusive women empowerment, education, productive through more and better human capital investment, strengthen investment in science, technology, innovation, and enhancing sustainability. Guatemala has led the national science and technology policy through the National Science and Technology Secretariat. And since uh, 2020 has paid special attention to empower women through access to science and technology information, attracting youth to STEM-related careers and promoting young researchers. For this purpose, we formulated a strategy for the inclusion of women and indigenous people in the science, innovation, and technology policy sphere. To address the historic exclusion that women and indigenous people have had to endure, the Senate seat 
has um, moved beyond rhetoric to action by implementing workshops to educate and raise awareness of the importance of increasing opportunities in STEM for these groups to foster a diverse pool of ideas, which is critical to economic innovation and productivity. Another important area of policy intervention is the promotion of digital literacy training for the population without access to technology through digital literacy workshops. The democratization of science, technology, and innovation entails the public having greater influence over these fields and that influence being shared more equally. Therefore, Guatemala is currently working on the transition of several official publications to Mayan languages. It wants to share, I want to share you, for example, uh, with the translation of Spanish and Tukachikel and Quiche, uh, which are Mayan languages. Um, this is an institutional product named Heroinas en la Ciencia, Tecnología y la Innovación. Heroines of Science, Technology, and Innovation created to make visible the work of Guatemalan female and, uh, scientists, encouraging, encouraging uh, and young girls and women to pursue a science career. Guatemala share a vision which can only uh, be achieved in collaboration with the rest of entities and agency of the public, private and academic sector, uh, research centers and other national and international non-governmental uh, organization. We have promoted the Alliance for the Development of Science and Technology in Guatemala, uh, that we call Alianza CTI. This is a declaration signed for more than 60 organizations to reaffirm the commitment to bring science closer to the Guatemalan society. So we are committed uh, in the quest to bridge the digital gender divide and democratize science. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate from Palestine. Shukran Sayyid al-Rais. Sayyidati Sadati, Asbah al-Asad Allah sabahakum. إنه لم يدوع السرور أن تكون أن نكون جزء من هذا الحوار المثمر والذي يشعرنا في فلسطين أننا نسير على الطريق الصحيح في مواكبة التغيرات العالمية لتحقيق نظام وبيئة جاذبة للابتكار والإبداع على كافة المجالات رغم كافة العقبات التي تواجهنا والصعاب وهنا نود الإشارة إن أن الجهد الذي يبذل في فلسطين في الجانب التنظيمي والقانوني جهد كبير جدا يهدف إلى دعم وتعزيز وتحفيز الإبداع والابتكار لخلق نظام بيئي جاذب حيث أولت الحكومة الفلسطينية ومنذ أن عملت في هذا المجال على تغيير التركيبة الحكومية بحيث يكون هناك وزارة مختصة للريادي والإبداع تعمل بالتعاون مع الشركاء الوزاريين على مختلف الوزارات على ترسيخ نظام واعتماد نظام بيئي جاذب للاستثمار والابتكار وتلخصت حيث اعتمدت على الإجراءات التشريعية والقانونية والتي تلخصت في خطة العمل بالعنقود التكنولوجي والتي شملت في تنفيذها اعتماد سياسة التحول الرقمي واعتماد أجندة سياسات دعم النظام البيئي للشركات الفلسطينية الناشئة في مجال تكنولوجيا المعلومات والاتصالات ضمن خطة عمل يجري تنفيذها حاليا لتحسين بيئة الأعمال في فلسطين وكذلك تشجيع إنشاء الشركات الناشئة ويتوقع أن يكون لهذه السياسة الأثر الكبير لتكون المرجع القانوني والتنظيمي للشركات الناشئة من حيث توضيح تصنيف الشركات الناشئة والنظام المحفز لها بمختلف نشاطاتها وتركيباتها كما أوجدت هذه السياسة نظام تعاون بين القطاع العام والخاص ضمن برامج عمل واقعية تنفذ حاليا وعالجت العديد من الإشكاليات بما يخص احتياج النظام البيئي المحفز عبر تبسيط وتخفيض تكلفة عمليات التسجيل والأعمال التي اقتصرت فقط على الحصر ومعالجة إجراءات الضريبة وتخفيض وتخفيضها لتكون شبه معدومة خلال فترة الإنشاء لهذه المشاريع والشركات كما ساعدت هذه السياسة إلى دعم البحث والتطوير والتعليم الفني وبناء القدرات 
من خلال الشراكات التي تم إدماجها خصوصا لفئة الشباب عبر الجامعات والكليات والمراكز التعليمية بهدف التوعية للاحتياجات السوقية داخليا وخارجيا ورسخت هذه السياسة التعاون بين القطاع العام والقطاع الخاص وتعزيز التفكير الابتكاري والإبداعي مع مراعاتها التامعة لجميع الإجراءات التي تمت التي اعتمدتها الحكومة ما يخص النوع الاجتماعي بكافة محتمياته كما عملت فلسطين على ترسيخ سياسة الأوبن داتا التي تهدف إلى توفير البيانات والمعلومات الموجهة للرياديين والمبتكرين في العمل لتكون مصدر المعلومات الاستثماري التي يمكن البناء عليها في الأبحاث والحلول الابتكارية وهنا نود الإشارة إلى أن فلسطين تواجه العديد من الانتهاكات من الاحتلال في هذا المجال حيث أن البنية التحتية للإنترنت لا تزال غير كافية وغير مبنية للاحتياج في هذا العمل كما أن هناك كما نود الإشارة الانتهاكات التي تستخدم الحقوق الأساسية التي أقرتها الأمم المتحدة وهي حرية الحركة والتنقل واستغلالها لجذب الإبداعيين والرياديين الفلسطينيين ضمن امتيازات غير اعتيادية يتم إدماجها لهم للعمل ضمن منظومة الابتكار الخاصة بالاحتلال بهدف الاستغلال على هذه الاستغلال هذه المهارات والابتكارات بما يضمن تحقيق مصالحها. في النهاية فلسطين تثمن وتمد يد المساعدة والشراكة مع جميع الشركاء بما يعزز التعاون الدولي لخلق بيئة جاذبة ومستثمر الإبداع شكرا Thank you I now give the floor via remote feed the distinguished representative from Mauritania Mr. Dr. Ahmed Almona, Director General Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to uh, participate uh, even remotely over the last few days in this uh, important conference. Um, I just want to start by congratulating uh, the, uh, the effort by both Angola and Botswana uh, on their uh, review policy and the review of their STI policies. It gives us hope in Mauritania because uh, I was following very carefully uh, the, the several steps that's been presented uh, of his, uh, and the finding of those reports. And it's very interesting because uh, it's almost reading about my own country. It's uh, very interesting indeed. It means that we are all in the same boat and we face the same challenges and we need to work together. And on this occasion, I like to invite my colleagues and from both countries and from other countries as well. We heard the similar uh, stories across uh, the world. So we really, uh, I invite my uh, distinguished colleague to uh, work together. Mauritania is extended its uh, cooperation hand uh, for uh, all of you guys to uh, develop more robust STI policies and also uh, particularly work on implementation because it looks like we need, uh, we need more effort on capacity building to develop robust implementation strategies and the implementation plan actually to carry out at least to see them on the uh, uh, in reality, to see them uh, around us. And uh, on this uh, point, I also would like to uh, uh, thank a recent uh, effort by uh, UN uh, Task Force, Inter Interagency Task Force, that, that I attended a conference by them, a capacity building workshop in Addis Ababa recently which was very useful. I would like to see more of those and we see them more uh, around the continent and around uh, the, uh, the South, the global South, so to speak, uh, for us to kind of uh, see more and more exchange on these uh, this experiences and share these success stories. We heard from Guatemala, we heard from Paraguay, we heard, uh, from you know several countries in uh, in South America and uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, Thailand. Uh, so similar stories at different level. 
similar stories at different uh, Dr. Levels. Ahmed, if you, can, uh, if you can thank you the wrap up, we only have two minutes for the interactive uh, discussions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I now give the floor to the distinguished representative from Brazil, very remote. Oh, in person? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Oops. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Actually, uh, it's more of a question uh, to the distinguished representatives from Angola and from Botswana. Well, first of all, I'd like to, to congratulate both countries on the reports. And uh, I'd just like to hear the view of the distinguished representatives from Angola and from Botswana, their view on South-South cooperation and uh, what it should uh, be characterized to be effective. Uh, is it possible to that the South-South cooperation is an effective man manner to bridge digital divides? Those questions in light of the reports that were presented. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brazil. We will give them the floor after the round of uh, discussions. I now give the floor to Lindwi Gama of South Africa. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, colleagues. I hope you can hear me. Uh, as indicated, my name is Lindwe Gama. I am from the Department of Science and Innovation. Can you hear me? We're losing your voice. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, my Honorable Minister from Angola, it's good to see you and uh, your commitment to STI development is applauded. Ms. Liso Khotamai, my colleague and representative of Botswana, the UNCTAD and the representatives of UNDP and uh, the CSTD chair, ladies and gentlemen, we just want to applaud the work that has been done by UNCTAD and UNDP in reviewing the uh, STI uh, 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 policies in Angola and Botswana and we will and the foresight in in Botswana these are really important reviews and the two countries that we are sitting here and discussing today are strategic and important countries for South Africa as they are both from the south and we really would like to thank the work that was also done by Botswana in making sure that they put in resources to make sure that the work is done these reports are very critical for the achievement of the 2030 Agenda Sustainable Development Goals, the African Union Agenda 2063 and CISA. And they will really assist the countries in making sure that as they develop their policies, they address the issues of poverty, hunger, education, health, which are very uh, rife in Africa. We cannot shy away from the fact that, that, that this important these are important for decision making and can be used as instruments for making strategic choices such as policy development, procurement development and governance of new technologies. Without the review of and assessment, it will not be easy to determine the gaps and the kind of interventions that are needed and the kind of partnerships and technologies that are needed to address the uh, challenges. These reviews are done at an opportune time when we are all talking about 4IR, AI, and Internet of Things, and uh, the countries will be able to also leapfrog uh, these uh, uh, technologies if they really implement the recommendations that were made. And some of the recommendations that were made for Botswana, such as the development of a funding institution, we applaud the fact that Angola is developing a fundisaid and it will come up handy and we will continue working with uh, Angola through the National Research Foundation to strengthen the work of the institution. We will also work together to learn from each other in the development of science parks and also look at the other recommendations. The issue of entrepreneurship, UNECO is currently undertaking a study on entrepreneurial university 
which was identified as key for South Af for Africa's development. Therefore, Angola may also take part on that. Botswana, it is good to note that the study was fully funded by the government. And uh, the study also highlighted the fragmentations. We can work together in addressing some of these issues as we are also learning and we can also learn from each other. The issue of the investment in R&D, we will continue to talk about that as we work together and also make sure that when we work, we also engage the private sector. On the issue of the parliamentarians' engagement, as you are aware, from the SADC uh, region, we hosted the UNESCO parliamentarians training in the previous years. And I think we can ha have to continue doing that and ensure that Botswana also takes part in that, in that. And we are ready to strengthen the STI cooperation as we have already started. We will work together to implement some of the recommendation as they need international collaboration. We wish the two countries all the best as they embark on implementing the recommendations from the reviews and the foresight that was done for Botswana. We will keep learning from each other and assist each other as we embark on implementing the recommendations. I thank you, Chair, and uh, good luck to the two countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now I give the floor to the panelists in light of the question from Brazil. Mr. Stoke. Thank you, uh, Chair, and, and thank you very much. Uh, muito obrigado uh, for the, to the delegate uh, from Brazil uh, for his question. South-South uh, <clears throat> cooperation, yeah, I, th I think it's um, very, very important. Um, but uh, the case is, of course, that countries are different, contexts are different. So you can't necessarily just take a solution in one country and do exactly the same thing in another country, obviously, but you can sort of work together. It's almost like this this system thinking approach. So you try to you you think something can work, and then you sort of try to adopt it and to make it your own. Uh, so with Brazil, uh, on another level, we are co collaborating um, on with the tax agency revenue service that is collaborating with the Angolan tax revenue service right at this uh, moment. <clears throat> we imported from uh, Honduras uh, ideas uh, on on the informal economy and using the markets uh, that also were like very important areas uh, for gathering for people in the informal economy to keep these markets going and, and to create brigades that we also did in Honduras. With Ecuador, we have um, uh, done uh, a collaboration on... Uh, using fintech financial technology um, for street sellers and informal sellers uh, and start making them part of the uh, economy uh, with colombia we fielded the mission from the government uh, and from the national bank of angola for <clears throat> uh, uh, issues around uh, access to finance and access to micro insurance uh, for people, there's some good practices there that we've learned from. With Indonesia, we are in touch on, on climate finance and access to carbon markets. And also with uh, Gabon, we are in touch. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of going on. And there's so many good ideas that countries are doing. So the more we can sort of know about these and try to experiment uh, if there's an interest, uh, it can be extremely, extremely powerful. So this, these types of fora really uh, are great for pitching ideas and to establish relationships and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I would like that uh, South-South cooperation is uh, an important component of the global cooperation and uh, it is included to accomplish the uh, 70 um, uh, sustainable development goal about partnerships. And we have many very good examples of uh, South-South cooperation uh, at the bilateral level, Angola in Brazil, for instance, Angola in South Africa, as you heard uh, before, Angola in Mozambique, 
and at the uh, multi multilateral level also in Sadek region, uh, in the Saskal for climate changes. So uh, really we have this South-South cooperation, but we must increase our cooperation. We have many uh, agreements between countries. Uh, some of them are only papers that lie hmm, without doing anything. But st just to, to say about Brazil, we have uh, uh, a program for uh, uh, the reinforcement of human capital. Uh, every year we send to the best universities of the world, the best students that has graduated for post-graduation, masters, uh, PhDs and uh, medical specialities. And we have an agreement with the University of Sao Paulo to have students doing uh, medical specialities at uh, uh, Hospital das Clínicas and also uh, a program to uh, have students in masters and PhD and post PhD in uh, Universidade of Sao Paulo. And we are also working uh, with our uh, funding agencies for STI, for Brazil, CNPq, South Africa, Mozambique, and our very recent uh, foundation for uh, uh, for the support for the funding of uh, science, technology, and innovation. So we are uh, in this cooperation. And uh, uh, as Stork said, there are different contests for the countries, but uh, this this is not for for us um, a bad expect is an opportunity to leverage uh, all the countries. Just this. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We still have uh, the Acting Permanent Secretary representing the Minister in Botswana, Ms. Lesago. Um, do you have an intervention in that question? Thank you. Let me appreciate the comments that have come through by the speakers. Um, in response to the presentation of our state review. And yes, a question has been posed um, on whether the South-South cooperation really is hope for it. I believe that there is. I believe that those that understand their problems are better placed to resolve them um, better, of course. Um, coming together and approaching the Northern as a unit, uh, usually it has weight on it. I would like to encourage that maybe what we need to do uh, in the South is to be, to clarify our priorities and the issue of foresight and priority setting is very important at national level, at regional level as well. We have the regional blocks that we can leverage uh, for that in the case, uh, like the Honorable Minister has just indicated, SADC, the AU and all that, we can work together with that so that we can be able to, with the other blocks in the other continents, uh, to participate and to collaborate with. And it's time, I know it's difficult for Botswana, it's very difficult to make resources available and to raise our investment in research and innovation is very important. And yes, as we establish the various funds, the resources that go into there also, they need to be quite significant so that as to um, facilitate the researchers and the innovators to do their work up to conclusion so that we are able to also commercialize to valorize the research that is undertaken in our countries. I would like to say on the, the bridging the digital divide is a major, major problem. And I think you would have heard when I was presenting also that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic exposed us and we are working on that. And the reset agenda that uh, the country is working on, the digitization um, pillar 
is working on bridging the digital divide in the country. And this as we do in through as, as regions, I believe that it will be it it will be improved. I think sharing notes, sharing ideas, working together uh, will be is the way to go uh, for our regions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I proceed to give the floor to Mr. Amr Mustafa, Assistant to President of the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology for an intervention from yesterday's item 3A. And if you can please uh, make it under three minutes. Good morning. Thank you so much for giving the opportunity to the Academy of Scientific Research in Egypt to deliver its presentation. I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the honorable guest at the stage. Uh, let me brief and within the allowed time to give you a glance about uh, what SRT, the Academy of Scientific Research in, in Egypt is doing. In fact, back in 1946, it was mentioned was one of our prestigious scientists at the time, Musharrafa, it, they need to establish a national academy in Egypt, 1946. In uh, uh, 2018, Nature, it was published that uh, Egypt and uh, Pakistan are having the highest raise in research output in uh, 2018. In fact, the Academy of Scientific Research is really playing an important role to link between research and, and the industry as well as the community needs. So our vision within the Egypt Vision 2030 is to have a competitive economy that counts on innovation and knowledge. Also, we rely very much to allocate our goals and the projects within the sustainable development goals that have been identified before by UN. So, going to the linkage between the strategic objective, object, objectives of Egypt Vision 2030 is it's in no, uh, water, energy, uh, food, life science, and so on. So also the academic scientific research is trying to really uh, have a nursing enabling a, a strategy to allocate other entities within this strategy. So we work very closely with the science technology uh, policy makers, building scientists, base, uh, base covering science, academia, industry, public partnership, and the international collaboration science for society. For the need of production, transfer of, uh, transfer of knowledge, and localizing this technology within Egypt in health, energy, clean water, food, agriculture, environment, engineering, and now we are moving ahead with uh, electronic car, cars and so on. So the main pillars that SRT is working really with the Egyptian community is uh, we have regional centers innovation invention supporting agency, and also the Egyptian uh, uh, STI observatory. We have uh, a science technology innovation observatory that really rely on measuring the indicators of the Egyptian society and submitted to national and international organizations. This is in, in brief our programs. I wouldn't go through it for the sake of the time. So ranking the academy of scientific research and technology globally, when 692 in Africa were the fifth, Middle East were in fifth. This is in terms of publication. So again, although we are not really a research by, by default, but we are enabling a researcher to do their work, still we are really very, doing very good in publications. One of the mega projects that we're really, really very proud to have it in Egypt is the Egyptian Genome Project, which is really uh, under the supervision of His, His Excellency President El Sisi to have uh, the first Egypt genome for Egyptians that will cost 2 billion Egyptian pounds over five years, which is considered a mega, one of the biggest, it's the biggest, in fact, a project in science technology in Egypt, uh, which really di directed very much to the health of Egyptians. Again, we have other, other program 
uh, to link between uh, uh, um, uh, innovations and incubators. We really provide them with seed fund grants. It's not equity, not loans, to enable researcher, innovators, entrepreneurs to convert their ideas into startups. And we have very good successful models in this regard. By the way, this bridge is one of the oldest in Egypt link between the two sides of the Nile River, and it was built by a French engineer. So this is uh, Intelac, the program started in 1950, and uh, 70 million Egyptian bound with a grant from the Academy of Scientific Research. We have over 28 incubators, 182 startups. We have created 1,600 1, jobs and revenue, not only revenue to the SRT, but the community itself is 21 million Egyptian bound. Again, this is one of the projects we are really uh, doing in uh, uh, renewable energy and solar energy as well. In agriculture, we are collaborating very much with the Ministry of Agriculture really to enhance the productivity of the Egyptian strategic crops, such as rice, wheat, maize, and even for the sake of uh, technology transfer, we have, you know, in, in this uh, silos, plastic ones, with it was a collaboration uh, because my colleague from Brazil was asking about South South collaboration. It, this was really a good model to, of collaboration between Argentina and Egypt to introduce the technology of plastic silos to Egypt. Again, for for uh, crops, we have the, the link. Uh, for the science and society itself, is really very good really to make society acknowledge the effort of science in their life. And here, this one of the exhibition was really uh, 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 honored by attendance of His Excellency the President El Sisi. And here we show him some of the examples of what we have, what done Egyptian innovators done in medical devices, agriculture, and so on. Again, uh, we have published one of the oldest magazine in the Middle East to simplify science and technology for them. By this, I end my talk and thank you so much. Thank you so much. This concludes the first part of our session this morning. We will now move on to the second part of our session on the highlights of technical cooperation activities under the CSTD. And we'll take a short break, short technical break. <clears throat> Excellencies, distinguished delegates, we will now move on to our second part of our session on the highlights of technical cooperation activities under the CSTD. I have the pleasure of inviting our director, Ms. Shamika Sarimani, the director of DTL, to present the overview. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I was telling the ambassador that this is one of my favorite sessions of the CSTD. The need for practical actions that help developing countries close the gaps that separate them from the technological frontier 
has been a constant theme of our discussions at the CSTD for, for many, many, many years. And you, as you know, in much of the world, capacities to utilize, adopt, and adapt those technological changes to progress towards the achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Agenda remain inadequate. And it remains at a really an aspirational level. So that is why over the years we have been working to develop the Commission as an open platform where proposals, experiences, and creativity can be leveraged to make a, a real difference on the ground. So against this background, please allow me to provide you with an overview of the capacity building activities being conducted and planned to strengthen South-South and North-South cooperation under the auspices of the Commission. And with a strong focus on the priority issues, in fact, identified by the commissions over the years. So as you may recall, at the 23rd annual session of the CSTD, I think just before COVID-19, one of the priority themes was exploring space technologies for sustainable development and the benefits of international research collaboration. And following the session, CSTD through the UNCTAD Secretariat has joined into a partnership with the Aerospace Information Research Institute of the Chinese Academy of Science. With generous support from the Alliance of International Science Organizations, this has resulted in the establishment of the Crop Watch Innovative Cooperative Cooperation Program. This initiative this, that features a real transfer of tech knowledge and sharing of technology with participating countries aimed to enhance developing countries' capabilities for food security and early warning using China's Crop Watch Earth Observation Satellite System for crop monitoring. As you know, when the, when the human eye can see that crops are withering, it is already too late to save them. But space applications can detect crop distress way in advance. And that's the beauty of the program, bringing technology to, to add the issue. Now, during the same 23rd session, the CSTD also reached an agreement with Okayama University in Japan to foster and nurture young scientific talent in developing countries through two programs. Uh, one for young female scientists and the other for young scientists uh, to do PhDs in, uh, in Okayama. Both programs, specially designed for CSTD member states in Africa and Southeast Asia, are intended to implement the SDG's target 9.5, which calls for enhancing scientific research in developing countries. Now, it is an impressive program, and let me give you an example of the Young Female Scientist Program. The young female scientists would pick a real life uh, a problem in their countries, and then Okayama University would match them with the right professors, and they will then begin a whole conversation. And you know, figuring out what needs to be done, and the young scientist, the, the female scientist, would then arrive in Okayama for for two weeks to one month program, and be in a lab and work on the on on the issue at hand, and then they go home, and 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 not only that, and then they prepare an enormous amount of scientific research with their mentor uh, professors. So this is this is another beautiful thing. And turning to last year's twenty fifth annual session of the CSTD. You know, this was in 2022, we invited the Atlantic International Research Center, AI Center, to speak at the session for the priority theme of science, technology, and innovation for sustainable urban development in a post-pandemic world. During that session, the vital role of frontier technologies, such as satellite technologies, was highlighted as key to achieving sustainable urban development. So after the constructive consultations after that, and with the generous support from the government of Portugal, I am pleased to announce that we will soon be offering technical assistance to enable participating countries to use geospatial data to build disaster resilience and improve water quality management capabilities in urban areas. So we will hear from our colleague from AIR there. 
And in the same 25th annual session, the Secretariat and the Government of Thailand, you probably remember we had a, uh, a session on biocircular and green economies to accelerate the achievement of SDGs. And as a direct result of that event, I am also pleased to report that UNCTAD and Thailand Science Research and Innovation are now collaborating to organize a workshop and training events for female entrepreneurs and researchers on the biocircular green economic model, BCG model in Bangkok, Thailand. And this was also just after the side event, there was an enormous request from member states to, to know more about the BCG model and to learn from Thailand experience. And Thailand was so generously, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving to the CSTD at uh, this learning opportunity for the CSTD member states. So we just signed the MOU and I'm very happy to say that we will begin this program. So given the importance of these activities, I'm grateful to welcome the principles of these partnerships here and they will present to you today in greater detail these technical cooperation activities. We have Professor Bingfang Wu on my right hand side, Professor Atsufumi Yokoi from Okoyama University and Dr. Uh, Patamavadi Pochunko uh, from the Thailand Science Research and Innovation uh, Program is here and Mr. Emir Siraj from the, from, uh, the Atlantic International Research Center is, is also here. So thank you for all of them. So distinguished delegates, I would also like to emphasize that these capacity building programs respond to the call in the ECOSOC resolution on STI for development to increase South-South, North-South and triangular cooperation through technical assistance, capacity building and technology transfer. They also follow up to the ECOSOC recommendation after re reviewing its subsidiary bodies in 2021 and 2022, including the CSCD, that we should continue aligning the work of uh, our commissions, ECOSOC commissions with the 2030 agenda. So let me end here by reiterating that the CSTD Secretariat is ready to work with you, our member states to launch new forms of partnerships and collaborations in STI for development. So please, we are just a telephone call or email or a WhatsApp away from you and offer these services through this multilateral platform. I know many of you have massive bilateral programs with countries to take STI for, STI for development but also please use the multilateral forums. I mean, the, I guess the return to investment is very high through multilateral forums. So just want to let you know that. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sarimani, uh, for, for your intervention and for um, your excitement of the session. I, I, I joined you and, and similarly, feel that technical cooperation is quite, quite important, especially the South to South connection uh, is an area that we should step up. Uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Bingfang Wu, International Association of National Science Organizations and China Academy of Sciences to present the CropWatch Innovative Program. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chess. It's my pleasure to be here to introduce the Global Watch Innovative Cooperation Programs for Global Monitoring. And this is a, a, a program is a, between UNDCAT and the, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences and also international balance of national organization, science organizations. And uh, we all we know the food security is uh, is uh, no is uh, this is not my presentation. It's an old one. Uh, I change one new presentations. This is the old one. Uh, I have changed my presentation. We'll take a, just a one minute uh, to fix the technical um, issue. So bear with us for a second.
while we do that, as uh, I hope that we will we will use this this opportunity um, while we are here to reach out to each other to forge relationships and collaborations. I think it is very very important that each of our countries are doing very unique um, aspects of STI. Use this this presence of yours to to network and to exchange information and to connect beyond uh, this forum. Uh, we need it because this is what will reinvigorate our countries. This is what will step us uh, into security, into food security, into health security, into delivery of services, into employment or employability, et cetera, et cetera. I think you have the correct presentation now. I just wanted to take the time. Uh, Mr. Wu, you have the floor. Thank you. issue is is still a challenging issues over the over the world, particularly in Africa and uh, South Southeast Asia, and recently the COVID nineteen or desert locust, drought, flooding, and the climate events also further threaten food securities. And uh, for those countries, if they are positive of uh, capacity in obtaining and accessing the up-to-date stable global protection information will pose the dangers of take decisions for those countries. If they are based on the information provided by the third party or, or the information that not verified, they will pick a danger for them to take decisions. And uh, oh, that doesn't work. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yes. So in the, in this regards, many countries want to set up their own uh, global monitoring systems. You can see many countries make a great effort want to set up their own global monitoring system. But however, the initiative cost and the operational costs is as well as technical skills, constraining many countries to set up, operate, and maintain global monitoring systems. You can know in, in this uh, in recent times, many countries in the world, many countries do not have their own global monitoring systems. Only a few countries, they have their own monitoring system, but they're not operated in, in effectively or maintain uh, long for a long time or deliver information which is needed by the countries. So, no. Yes, and uh, and another on the on, on the other hand, the combination of uh, clubs and the phenology and the place all linked together. Sorry. make uh, the global monitor uh, data streams very complex. So if you want to develop the system, technical also is a big issue. So that's why existing systems, global monitoring systems, we have a very limited functions, mostly fixed on the global condition assessment. Many systems don't have the global air, global yield, and the protection forecasting uh, functions. And the, the methodology developed uh, this until now, more, many of these new methodology are not implemented as a operational activities because of stream, data streams are very complex. So in this way, we are China, Chinese academic sciences developed the global watch 
systems for our own users before. We are using this club watch to do the uh, quarterly and annually bloatings on the global global monitoring covering 173 countries and also special focus on the 43 key uh, agricultural changes. And then in this, uh, uh, in order to uh, improve the efficiency and the maintaining cost, reduce the maintaining cost, we are moved the cloud watch to the cloud basis, Alibaba Ali Cloud. And then this uh, cloud in, including uh, consists of uh, four components, cloud watch processing, cloud watch data exploring, and all the cloud watch analysis, and also cloud watch bluetings. And this certain once we are moving this technology to the cloud, we find this uh, platform can not only be used by ourselves, also can be accessed by anyone in any place, any time. So you can also use by other uh, places. And uh, and uh, and the uh, cloud watch also have a, uh, have a tools for the ground choose data collections. We develop uh, because the for ground ground data collection is very expensive, labor and time consuming. So we develop there are two uh, tools to to improve the ground data collections. One is on the GVG global type of identification from the field. And automatically, once you have take a photo from the field with the geotech, you can immediately identify what kind of clubs in the photos. And also another one, the field watch for the user data measurement. We don't need to cut the clubs. We can to using the uh, image recognition to identify how many shoots in the field, uh, how many grain in each shoot, the size of the grain, so then can be uh, measured the uh, yield. You don't need no, need to cut in the field. So this immediately the, or if, uh, significantly improve the efficiency for the field workers. And the Club Watch also, uh, we have uh, uh, 42 indicators uh, covering the global climate, economic indicators, and the air yield and produce as well as early warnings. So there are four group of uh, indicators for the for people to choose. And we package all these indicators in the API, uh, APIs, uh, which can be accessed by anyone in the world from any time to, and also develop their own uh, uh, package for the global monitoring. And, the current, uh, and then for example, the the cloud watch can acting as a processing engines. You you can upload your your data to the uh, to the uh, cloud watch cloud cloud clouds. Then you can pro, pro, uh, process the data as you need. Then download the result to your own uh, systems and provide the services. We are doing this together with the talent and uh, link it together. Both uh, uh, working. Uh, to, uh, jointly, so you don't need to develop a, a very complex, uh, complex uh, methodology in your own system. You just using uh, cloud, uh, cloud watch as a processing engines. So save time, save energy for for the system development. And uh, also in the uh, currently we are working together with uh, twenty two countries over the world. And of them, uh, 14 countries are uh, under coordination by the architect of this project. I will go into introduce it later. So uh, in the, the project of, uh, we are working together with, under coordination of architect called the Global Watch Innovative Cooperation Program for Global Monitoring. This is to facilitate and stimulate global monitoring at the developing countries for the advancement of SDGs, of zero hunger, and uh, the, with uh, two specific uh, uh, objectives. One is enable particip participating countries to do respective uh, national or sub-national global monitoring by themselves in real and real, time, real times. And also we are with this to promote resilience agricultural practices by integrating geospatial information for global, global monitoring. The many uh, key actions on the on the project is uh, first we provide training, 
and the workshop and the all the job training in Beijing and or in the field for the verification. And also we are going to customize Global Watch for the specific requirement of from countries. And then we call it on the also regional workshop to exchange on the shares experiences. The expectation from the program, the first of all, we train the staffs of the participant countries who has the ability to use the cloud to do the global watch, global monitoring by themselves. And also they can perform uh, as a trainer for the sub-national officials. So that empower more technical people for the global monitoring in the countries. And uh, we also hope the participant countries can produce regular bulletins with the support of a global watch cloud in order to support, inform the national or sub-national uh, policy makers at, uh, for the food market or uh, for the export or import or for disaster relief purpose. And in, in last two years, we under the coordination of Anker Tat, we are provided uh, three months longer uh, uh, training courses to 14 countries on the first, uh, on the on the salary methodology and the applications, and also during these uh, three months of training, we do the online practice because Club Watch is online, so everyone can practice uh, with the guide of people. So people, when they during the online practices, they also can make uh, analysis, country analysis, for example, the country from Algeria. Myanmar, they, they join the workshop, uh, training workshop, then they carry out the country analysis for the uh, May bulletins of this. And also uh, following the training uh, workshop, we do the technical, provide technical support to country by countries, make a work out the work plan for every country and they also carry out the requirement analysis to understand what every country really needed, what kind of a club they are focused on, what kind of a detail level they want to go uh, from country or sub country or to local for this. And also we do the uh, virtual field workers and uh, provide support and also the train them how to analyze the club the indicators for us. And also the, we do the uh, virtual joining field workers, people in the local, in the countries, they go to field workers. If they have a technical issues, so we provide uh, virtual support in order to make sure they can do the field work efficiently and correctly. And also we, are, uh, we for example, we, for the Mozambique, we really, uh, with uh, several training courses, and we customize the system for the Mozambique and the LAN since uh, 2018. They can use in the Club Watch for the Mozambique, carry out their own uh, monitoring, global monitoring for security, and they include these results into national meteorological bulletins with the support of Club Watch. And uh, you can see here the uh, the people from uh, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Agriculture and the Rural Development of Mozambique says we use Club Watch mainly for global production focused in during the learning season, which you can inform uh, policy making at the national and the production provincial levels in the department. And this has been selected as uh, uh, Lulu solutions by the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And also in, in Nigeria, they, uh, they join us for the lease project. They carry out, they, are doing the, they set up project implementation teams to, to, to follow the, the training courses and also activities of project. And all the indicators are tailored for three levels, from national to state and local units. As he, she mentioned yesterday, it's really good for them. First time for them can do can go to local levels to provide support to local people or local state holders 
And then they also set up uh, stakeholders meetings to, I mean, including the Ministry of Agriculture, Environment, and the Water Resources. So make it, make it more people who are benefited from the from the Cloud Watch uh, uh, information. And also they can do the, they want to do the taking this, taking this top uh, support to the regional countries, not only in Nigeria, but also to the regional countries in the West Africa. And in the future, we, next steps, we will, uh, we will have a regional workshops in Mauritius and also in, in Thailand in this year. And then we will have uh, further security sessions in the ANSO conferences. And then we will still, we were working on hand-on trainings for the people on the field and also in Beijing for countries, uh, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, or Nigeria and Mauritius from May to November. So it's a tough years this year because of the last two years is because of COVID-19, we cannot travel in the field, also cannot bring them to Beijing. But now this year is, uh, is possible. So we will finish all these work training, on the job trainings in, in Beijing. And at the same time, when they are in Beijing, we can we can customize the Chrome Watch for the technical for the for their own uh, really for the uh, requirement, uh, specific requirements. And uh, and uh, in, in the uh, in the meantime, we are now uh, ongoing system customization for the countries, Syria, Algeria, Nigeria, and Thailand, by using their lo local languages. For the other countries, we don't need a uh, translator to the local language. For for some countries, we are using the local local languages for that. And also, uh, Club Watch is uh, very flexible. It can be tell it as their own uh, global money systems because all global financing is a, is a, is a package as an API. So you can code and package it for, for the country. You set up their own uh, global money systems. And uh, uh, we, you don't need uh, additional investment on the storage and on the computations because all this is, is on the cloud. And you, you just take uh, your requirement or chains then you can use the color watches. And uh, more, con more countries are welcome to join us. If you, you are interested, please contact Uncle Cat to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Wu, for your presentation. Let me now turn to Mr. Atsufumi Yukoi, Senior Vice President of Kayama University to present the Young Female Scientist Program and Young Scientist PhD Program. You have the floor, sir. Uh, can you hear me all right? Okay, thank you. Uh, Excellency, distinct delegates and all attendees, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today to share with you all in the session uh, anchored at Okayama University, a young female scientist program, and a young scientist PhD program. So in my today's presentation, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce my university very quickly. And afterwards, I'd like to give you a brief overview of this joint program in collaboration with ANCDAD. I'd like to start with this slide. Oh, sorry, this one. <laughs> All right. Uh, the 30th anniversary of Uni Twin, UNESCO Chair Program Conference, uh, because I work for UNESCO as UNESCO Chair in Research and Education for Sustainable Development. And as UNESCO Chair, I was invited to discuss future of higher education. Together with distinguished delegates, are from five countries. So briefly, we believe that universities must be transformative to heal the growing fracture that divide humanity and facilitate collective responses with cooperation over competition to avoid the catastrophe that threaten the survival of humanity and the planet. So in this regard, 
Okayama University in Japan and Okayama region have worked together for education for sustainable development for over the decades. So as you can see here, so first of all, Okayama City was certified by United Nations University as one of the world's first several regional center of expertise in the field of ESD in 2005. The following this, Okayama University became Asia's first UNESCO chair in the field of ESD in 2007. So since then, Okayama University and Okayama region have worked together for ESD for more than a decade with triple helix manner between academia, industry sectors, and also civil society, government, and together with over 250 organizations uh, through the about 40 community learning centers across the Okayama prefecture in a non-formal education manner from kids to elderly for sustainable development. And with this reputation and achievement, uh, we, this is a truly hallmark of the year. In 2014, Okayama co-hosted the UNESCO World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development. And after that, we received a prestigious award from the UNESCO Japan Prize in ESD in 2016, and also the UNESCO Learning City Award in 2017. And then Okayama University crafted strategy and vision, a leading globally engaged education and research center uh, for sustainable development. And then uh, we received the first Japan SDGs Award uh, special prize from the government of Japan in 2017. And so far, we are only national public university with a, such a prestigious award from the government of Japan in the field of sustainable development goals. We are only one right now. And more importantly, we were invited by United Nations uh, headquarters in New York uh, to participate in the uh, HLPF, uh, particularly at UNESCO side event focusing on UNESCO initiative ESD for 2030, uh, in order to deliver our experience of whole institutional approach to the SDGs, which was also inspiration for like-minded organization and higher education institution uh, around the world. And as such, Okayama University and UNCTAD signed MOU for comprehensive cooperation on the development of human resources in STI for SDGs, which is the very first of its kind. Are we thank you? <laughs> it makes a little bit noise for you. Sorry about it. And uh, yeah, very first of its kind among university around the world. So uh, right now we have two flagship programs. One, young female scientist program. Two, doctoral degree program for young researchers from developing countries. Uh, first of all, young female scientist program. Uh, this program is targeting female scientist under the age 40. So since the start of this program, Okayama University welcomed 21 young female scientists from Africa and ASEAN region totally. Our first batch was unable to come to Japan due to COVID-19 instead of online training. But for the second batch, 14 participants from five different countries conducted research for 14 days to 30 days in Japan. 
Uh, recently, uh, two of our short-term program participants were officially featured in the UNCTAD article for the International Day of Women and Girls in Science on 11 February. Uh, after participating in this program, they are working on publishing research papers uh, using the data uh, they have collected and analyzed under this short-term program. So for example, uh, Mr. El Zerafi, an assistant professor and researcher at the Center for Genomics at the Zuel City of Science and Technology in Egypt, focuses on DNA repair mechanism. So she conducted research at Okayama University for two weeks. So she said, we'll continue working on projects in both Egypt and Japan simultaneously in the future. We'll also apply for funding to support the project and enable further research visits. Uh, the second case is uh, Ms. Klai Makosa, an associate professor in the Department of Medical Myo, uh, Microbiology at the University of the Philippines, uh, focuses on the prevention and control of diseases, including tuberculosis. Uh, she conducted research at the Okayama University for one, one month. Uh, she said, I'm exploring uh, sending Filipino graduate students at Okayama University for possible sandwich research programs to further strengthen the collaboration. Uh, lastly, apart from the second batch, Maridin Kim, uh, who heads Labi Center at the Yaoundé Central Hospital in Cameroon is one of the seven researchers of the first batch. Most of the scientists participating in the program have chosen health or medical science uh, related research because we were established as medical science school at that time in 1870. But Ms. Kim's research investigates the social and family determinants or risk factors of addictive behavior in young people in Cameroon. As she said, the program offered me an opportunity to deeply reflect on addiction issues and drug use disorders in particular. It has enabled me to come up with strong and evidence-based recommendations for addiction management. So uh, this is a just example, but in the end of the program, we held short-term research result presentation and Director Shiriman and also Mr. Abi Solomon and joined the presentation session in person in Japan, Okiyama, for the short-term program, uh, actually uh, in the beginning of the year. So many of the particip participants joined online to give the research results presentation. Uh, so uh, we are delighted to announce upcoming application information 2023 to 2024. 12 CSTD member states are considered as follows. Application deadline, 30th April, 2023. Okay, last one, doctoral degree program for young researchers. Master's degree holders are from the CSTD member states, mainly in Africa and ASEAN region are eligible. So they can study at the graduate school of environmental and life science 
at Okayama University for three years for a doctoral degree. Right now, a three students from Nigeria, Madagascar, and the Philippines have enrolled under the program. Well, with these achievements and activities, Director Shiriman uh, visited Okayama University in January this year to give a special lecture, Catching Technological Wave, Innovation with Equity. Uh, to be actually uh, held uh, as a brand new sustainable building at Okayama University uh, called Okayama Visionary Commons. Uh, which is made of a uh, brand new wooden material, uh, cross laminated timber. But the Okayama region is the real largest producer, this sustainable brand new material, cross laminated timber, uh, which make us a uh, high large wooden sustainable building and also long span wooden structure. So this is a real icon of sustainable uh, uh, development of Okayama University, by the way. This is uh, one of another strengths of Okayama University. All right, this is a uh, uh, last but not, not the least. Uh, IAEA and Okayama University uh, work together on advancing viral neutron capture therapy to help fight cancer. Because cancer therapy is also another strength of Okayama University because we were established as medical science school at the time, 150 years ago. And an agreement signed in Vienna last year uh, during the IEEE's 66th uh, General Conference designates Okayama University as the very first IAEA collaborating center in this field. So we are preparing for a new human resource development program in this field of the cancer therapy into the future. Uh, I must stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, some application uh, from interested uh, member states uh, for this program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yokoi, for your presentation. You have something else? Excuse me, uh, we have a video message of incoming president of Okayama University uh, to your floors. So just for a couple of minutes. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, and all attendees, thank you for this opportunity to participate in this session for UNCTAD Okayama University Young Female Scientist Program and Young Scientist PhD Program. First, as the next president of Okayama University from this April, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to Dr. Shamika Shuriman, Director of AMCTAT, Division on Technology and Logistics, and your team for all the hard works and the commitment to our joint programs. After three years of fruitful collaboration that empowered 21 young female researchers and three PhD students from Africa and ASEAN region through the programs. It is truly wonderful to be virtually with you all together today in Geneva. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on all 17 SDGs goals have told us that what started as a health crisis has become a crisis for humanity and the planet. While this crisis is impeding progress towards the SDGs, it is also making their achievement more urgent than ever before. In this regard, we need a transformative recovery from the human and the planetary crisis that realized the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement during the UN Decade of Action. By maximizing their synergies in a multi-stakeholder partnership manner, 
especially strengthening the UN university relation. In order to change our direction towards a just, peaceful, and sustainable world, I believe that universities must be transformative to heal the growing fractures that divide humanity and facilitate collaborative responses to avert the catastrophes that threaten the survival of humanity and the planet. It is my hope that universities should become not just an engine for growth, but also the engine for the well-being of humanity and the planet. In this light, Director Shuriman's special lecture at our university in January on the new waves of technological innovation with equity was truly a unique opportunity for all of us to explore how the relationship between UN and the universities can support the international community in building back better together. Science, technology, and education are essential to humanity's collective responses to this crisis, both globally and locally. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, in particular, the empowerment of women and youth, are also critical to create our shared vision for our shared planet. On the other hand, we all know that women face immense barriers in science and technology. And many developing countries lack the resources to train scientists to the highest academic level, said Director Schreiman at the special lecture. Therefore, through our joint programs, Okayama University encourages young people from developing countries, especially women, to explore new values about the new waves of technological innovation with equity, inclusiveness, and sustainability in mind, and to gain new knowledge, new skills, and new international collaborative networks. In closing, I would like to once again thank you for your tremendous efforts for our UNCTAD and Okayama University joint programs. Let me finally wish this commission a successful outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having the incoming president join us. This is uh, an honor, really. So thank you so much, um, Mr. Yokoi, for facilitating this. Um, let me now turn to Ms. Patamawadi Pukanokol, president of Thailand Science Research and Innovation, to present the bio, circular, and green growth. You have the floor, madam. Thank you so much, Mr. Sherman and Dr. Sriman, to uh, give uh, Thailand a chance to be on this stage. So uh, today I would like to share with you uh, some uh, concepts and our uh, cooperation which is going to take place in the very near future. The topic is on biocircular and green growth or green economy. Uh, we call it BCG model. Okay, so, uh, yeah. so first of all, I would like to introduce the, um, the model, the concept to you first, and then uh, later on I will uh, uh, say it, what we are going to do in the near future uh, with the untapped. Uh, so this is the BCG model, which is a new sustainable growth engine. Yeah, it is actually SDG in a Thai context. Uh, we have three keywords. The first of all is uh, bioeconomy. This is uh, value creation in bio-based manufacturing and service sectors. The second one is circular economy, the loop of sustainable resource use. And the last one is green economy, environmental friendly production. Uh, this is based on some background of Thai economy. We start with the bio-based economy. We are in, in rich, uh, rich with biodiversity and cultural diversity. 
Okay, but uh, for uh, path of development, we are confronting some serious problem. Uh, first one is natural resources and environmental degradation. The second one is low prices of agricultural products. And the last one is aging society. And of course, everyone uh, are in health uh, threatened of uh, climate change. So we must find a new way to survive and to continue our uh, sustainable growth. The concept is environmental friendly, higher value agricultural products and other bio-based products and skill young workers and entrepreneurs. So in this model, we apply uh, circular concept and green concept uh, using focusing on R&D investment to help uh, Thailand uh, to going out from uh, some uh, vicious circle which is happening. So we focus on four uh, industries. The first one is tourism and creative economy. The second one is high value agricultural products and food industry. For example, health food, uh, functional food, and whatever. The third one is medical and life science uh, uh, industry. And the last one is alternative energy. This is what we expect for sustainable production and consumption. When we design this, we go back to the principles of SDG model in the Thai context. We start with uh, some philosophy that many, some people here may have heard about it. We have the concept of sufficiency economy philosophy. Actually, this is the Buddhism concept of moderation, reasonable, resilient, uh, using uh, knowledge and ethic. Okay, so, so we call this is uh, SEP, SEP, Sufficiency Economy Philosophy. The second one, we merge with SDGs, which is Sustainable Development Goals. And then we apply STI or science and technology innovation. So you can see from this diagram that uh, the concept is born some is based on philosophy, based on some goals, based on the STI tools. So we blend this and uh, design BCG model in a Thai context. The movement, first of all, we prioritize R&D, for example. Uh, this is because our uh, organization is the one who uh, take care of R&D, but for a new development, a new engine of growth that we need more R&D, uh, science and technology to uh, and invest more so that we can move economy to a, a desirable trend. Okay. From prioritization, we have strategic uh, investment. And third one, which is important is uh, collaboration. Quadruple helix here is referred to the government, academics, private sector, and civil society. And we add global partnership so that uh, we can uh, go together hand in hand and uh, to jump more or less, we may need a technological transfer from abroad, but for some expect, we may have uh, experience to share with other countries. Okay, so this is the concept that we designed BCG model. Okay, so uh, actually the concept here is uh, start around uh, the year 2018, I think, but the government has just announced this is a BCT as a new sustainable growth engine, a strategy to drive the economy and uh, social development in the year 2021. Okay. Uh, the four important pillars, first one is for sectoral development, which I mentioned earlier. The second one is area-based development. Third one is talent uh, entrepreneur development. And the fourth one is frontier research and knowledge development. So uh, this is what we are going to do in action. This is uh, this gives you an example of how we design. Uh, a one triangle represents one sector. So at the bottom or the base of the pyramid, we aim at productivity improvement, appropriate technology, and inclusiveness uh, so that it can involve with uh, many people and have a mass uh, scale for uh, movement. And on the top of the pyramid is high value added and with using advanced uh, 
ST or science or technology. For example, uh, if we go to the food and agricultural sector, basically on the base, we have precision agriculture, we have waste management. And then on the top, we may have extraction, breeding, and functional food. Okay, uh, this is how we decide for uh, industries that we are working. Okay, so doing that, uh, we design the BCG projects in four levels. The first one is national level, uh, national projects or regional, uh, regional development level. The second one is on sectoral projects or sectoral level. The third one is community project or community level. And the last one is international collaboration. An example of uh, at the national level is that we have uh, economic corridor. Uh, many people may, some people may have heard about this. We designed this uh, for a while, but uh, the progress is not uh, that much. But what we are trying to do is that uh, early this month, the government assigned TSRI as an uh, uh, organization to take care of S and T, STI development in Thailand to get involved directly as a major partner to move this uh, investment in BCG at the uh, regional level. So we have the economic corridor in uh, five regions. And you may have heard the biggest one on uh, EEC or Eastern Economic Corridor. This is an example that uh, you have uh, several uh, infrastructures that are prepared for uh, investment and for the progress of the sector. For example, we have a pilot plant. We have uh, some uh, food in your police, no police, and other facilities. So this is the investment at the regional level, and many of them are national lab and national infrastructure. Okay. For the sectoral levels, this is an example of Nakhonsawan bio complex invested by several. Uh, public uh, organizations in Thailand uh, focus on bioethanol plant and what is important is bioplastic, uh, which aims that uh, we can uh, transform uh, to more environmental friendly uh, with the bioplastic. And we have another example at the community level. This is an example that we have in small villages uh, for example, biogas for manure, we have solar dome for producing dry fruit. We have herbal products that are organized by uh, local entrepreneurs. And we have something like a crab bank to conserve marine resources. So we have a lot of uh, programs and projects on, in the local areas. And we, uh, we as STI, investment we support uh, to try to induce more uh, advanced technology so that uh, communities can work well with the new tools of uh, development. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, some research and innovation programs to support the development for all level from uh, uh, regional level, provincial level, sectoral levels, and to local communities. For example, on biomass, as I mentioned, bioplastic, uh, we have a concept and try to uh, transform our tourism to be carbon neutral tourism and by using uh, some kinds of uh, research and innovation to help uh, supporting the transformation of the sector. AI, for example, is uh, in, an important role, role for this. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, we have some uh, advanced technology for example, uh, energy storage technology or whatever. So we looking at the whole map of the uh, major industries and try to make a transformation from the policy level downward to the community level. Okay. So uh, when we drive BCG to uh, at the regional level in Thailand, but uh, we think uh, international collaboration is important. So uh, we uh, have the big meeting and we announced uh, Bangkok goals on BCG in the year 2022. The first one is zero emission. The uh, second one is zero waste and sustainable uh, consumption and production. 
the preservation and conservation of environment and biodiversity and increased use of uh, STI and digitalization. And what is important is social inclusion, human resources and development. Okay. Lastly is uh, what we are going to do next after uh, we uh, trying to uh, put a lot of efforts in Thailand for a while. I think it's, we think it's time for us that we may share uh, some of the successful uh, projects and uh, can be uh, shared with some other uh, countries that are interesting in what we are doing. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, the concept is important and you can, uh, we hope that the partner countries can learn and adopt and adapt their own uh, style of BCG, okay. So uh, first of all, we just set uh, the workshop entitled STI Capacity Building Program on Female Researchers and Entrepreneurs to Promote uh, BCG Model. And I can say that in Thailand, many of local entrepreneurs, for example, are women and they are very successful. And we have uh, quite a number of scientists at the laboratory as well, so that we can share and we can uh, see the roles of the women and the female, okay, and the youth in uh, developing and pushing BCG in progress. So the project uh, will run, okay, we will start uh, in April, okay, but the work the workshop in Bangkok will be on in in August from the sixth to twelfth of August this year. Uh, then anyone who are interested in the project can uh, apply. We will send you an invitation invitation letter and uh, probably start uh, early uh, April okay, so that we can have preparation and uh, let's have a workshop in Thailand on in August. Okay. Uh, the eligible countries we have, uh, we plan for 15 is T, uh, CSTD members in Africa and in Asia. Objective is to build STI uh, capabilities among female researchers and entrepreneurs of developing countries to adapt and implement their national in their, uh, in their national context, the concepts of the BCG as an approach to facilitate the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, so the last slide is expectation. We hope that uh, these activities will uh, enhance and encourage uh, the South-South co collaboration and participants can uh, implement uh, BCG models within their own local context. And we can create a network of uh, sharing and learning for the sustainable development among countries and hopefully UNTAC will uh, obtain some information which may be useful for UNTAC to move forward and using Thailand as one of the example, um, more or less, not, not every project are successful, but we have many successful projects and we hope that yeah we can share with you and learn with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ukanakol for your presentation. Let me now turn our next presentation. Regrettably, Mr. Emir Siraj, Chief Executive Officer, Atlantic International Research Center could not join us today. However, he has delegated Dr. Yao Pinelo, Head of Data Science, Cloud Infrastructure and Development and Senior Project Officer to present the satellite technologies for sustainable urban development project. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Secretary, Mrs. Director of the CSTD, dear colleagues. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about our work, mainly uh, satell using satellite observation um, technologies for sustainable urban development. Yeah. 
Sorry. Okay. Uh, so I'm, go I'm going to start by uh, introducing the Art Center. We are a re relatively new organization with around four years old. And uh, I'm going to share our experience um, that justifies that we are in this context of uh, starting the new project. And I'm starting, and then I'll, I'll discuss the beginning, the start of this new project with Anktat. Um, uh, Uh, okay, so uh, overview of the Earth Center, of in particular the work we do at the Earth Observation Lab, lab part of the Earth Center, and throughout this, I'm going to talk about be talking about the applied science, digitalization, data science, database reporting, and capacity building. The Earth Center works with uh, uh, this this mission: uh, clean and productive basin and estuaries, uh, resilience to coastal uh, natural coastal hazards, sustainable food production, improved management of marine and coastal resources, improved environmental and maritime monitoring. So around the um, the SDGs, and we aim to serve the scientific community, job creation, stimulate job creation, and to monitor and contribute to reaching the UN SDGs. We have a vision of having an integrated system of systems because our work is based on science and based on data. The Earth Center started in 2018, so we're very recent, um, but we've been uh, very active. You, you see a photo here of the high level dialogues in 2018 that led to the start of the Earth Center. But we have we've been creating a network. We've been very active submitting proposals. We have from 80 that we submitted, we have 49 funded. Um, we have 21 countries with strong relationships. We organize many events and, and very close uh, to 120 uh, PhD applications. In 2022, we signed 10 MOUs. Um, we organized more than 20 international events around the Atlantic. And um, we have this networking Fridays, uh, 17 per, per year, which are YouTube events for science. So we have our own network that we've been developing around the Atlantic, but we're also part of other networks. For example, the United Nations Environment Program Network, we are Grid Azores. We are an Ezalab, Ezalab Azores. And we are part of the Foundation and Science Technology in Portugal, so the scientific community in Portugal, and that also gives us access to the GENT network. We're also the World Secretary for the Ambon Marine Biodiversity Network. I included some slides such as this, which I'm not going to talk much about. I'm just going to pass them quickly, skip them but it's for your reference they are in the presentation that will be given to you later so this is our team there we are based in the azores and these are our offices we have at the moment 29 projects running from the 39 ha that have been approved uh, including a very new blue mission a coordinated support action uh, other projects with funding from different sources, including the European Special Agency and Copernicus. This is an example of a project where we um, use satellite data, remote sensing data, to analyze air pollution. Here, uh, same uh, technology, Copernicus technology for marine litter and for uh, fires. And during COVID, during the pandemic, COVID-19, we also did a study on um, water quality. At the moment, we have a prototype working. This is one example, a prototype working that delivers information to farmers, uh, early warning system, 
that they can use on an hourly basis. It's a synthesis of data fusion from satellite data and in situ data. Uh, and the farmers can just consult on any web platform and the, the, the level of risk on one side and then the validation as well uh, on this application risk for the, the cattle. Uh, we have a direct receiving station and a data center, which we built and assembled in the last year. It's a very small data center, but um, it, it's a start for our to, to store and process in a, the, the remote sensing data. And we also have access to high resolution satellite data. In the last couple of years, we organized seven training events. Uh, mostly on earth observation, but not exclusively, mostly in the Azores, but also uh, in Cape Verde and Senegal. Very important, uh, and a capacity training event uh, about Julia. Julia is a relatively recent programming lang language created at the MIT. It's open source, and it's really empowering, empowering things we can do with earth observation data, which was always and is still a bit of a problem because it's very difficult to use this, this data. And we have other outreach actions. For example, this one, uh, we call them ideation days where we try to inspire the new younger generations. We, have, we call them to the office for one day and we show them what technology can do and what we've been doing with it. Um, and we do good um, brainstorming sessions about new, new uses of technology. So the project that calls us here today, Satellite Technologies for Sustainable Urban Development. Um, it will have a duration of 24 months, uh, imp implemented by the UNCTAD and the Air Center together, uh, involving some uh, up to 10 uh, developing countries and with the outcomes, improved capacities. Um, so capacity building being the center of the project. Expected outputs on this first stage uh, improve the ability of participating countries to use satellite data for applications that promote sustainable development and, of course, uh, documentation of this uh, effort. In terms of activities uh, around training, uh, countries are to be defined uh, yet, but in terms of project development, we have to confirm the countries, identify local partners. This is for us is absolutely critical. We always work with local partners and stakeholders. Uh, we need to uh, respond to their needs. Um, uh, so then identify the needs, needs use cases, uh, identify the Copernicus uh, open data, and then uh, create a team and organize the workshops report on the project. So it will be about capacity building and the contents will be identify, locate and ingest relevant satellite data that responds to the needs and use cases specific of uh, the country involved. Then manipulate, clean, analyze and interpret the data, fundamental steps. And then the most important, how to generate information to support uh, policy making and to support reporting on the pro progress of the, the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, I thank Mr. Pinello for his presentation. We will defer the next presentation of His Excellency, Dr. Is it her? Okay. Yes. Her Excellency, Dr. Leah Buendia, on the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology of the Philippines um, for the next segment. Um, we've run out of time. It's lunchtime and we apologize for that, but we will reconvene to take up the remaining aspect of our agenda. We thank you all, and we wish to thank all presenters and participants for your contributions to our session uh, today. The CSTD formal session will resume this afternoon at 3 p.m with the opening 
presentation of Her Excellency Dr. Leah Buendia. And then um, we will start with item two on WISIS. Prior to that, please note that there is a hybrid side event as announced in the program starting at 1.20 p.m. You can either attend the event in this room or connect through the Zoom link. Sandwiches will be served outside the meeting room. This meeting is adjourned. Only for those who come back. Yeah.